Thank mm-hmm. you.
Good morning, Life Spring. It's so, so good to be in the house of the Lord. <laughs> Although you guys are at home, that's okay. We're going to worship together. And、um, I just want to encourage you that you are home and, and you don't have to worry about anybody looking at you or watching you or thinking your worship is strange or feeling like you're standing out. So I encourage you, just go ahead and worship. Worship with your whole heart, lift your arms. Just close your eyes and let the Lord minister to you. Let Him speak to your heart as you worship Him. He is always with us, and it is a privilege that we have to be with Him always. And we just thank you, Lord. Thank you for your presence, God. Oh, you're a man of your word. All things are possible when we believe. All chains are breakable when we receive Yahweh. You keep your promises, Yahweh, Yahweh. You keep your promises. You said it. Believe it if you said it. If you said it, we believe it. I am who 
you say I am Yes I am
promises, yes and amen, all your promises, and all your promises, are yes and amen, you will do what you've said, all your promises, yes and amen, all your promises, all your promises, are yes and amen, oh Yahweh. sing his name. Yahweh. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness, God. We celebrate you. We worship you. We love you. Because <laughs> you never fail. You never leave. You're the same. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, Life Spring. I hope right now, as you look out your window, you have these beautiful big snowflakes falling right now. And it, your, your outside is being transformed into this winter wonderland. That's my hope. That's my prayer for you. At least that's what the weather report promised, and I hope it's true for you right now. So I hope you're curled up, you're comfortable, you're warm, you got that cup of coffee, maybe that cup of hot cocoa, you're looking outside, seeing the beauty, and you're ready to focus on God, and that's awesome. Uh, I hope you're able to get out later, explore the snow, maybe walk in it, uh, maybe make some snow angels, build a snowman, but just enjoy it. It's Believe it or not, it's a gift from God. Uh, this morning is Sanctity of Life Sunday. It comes once a year, and it's a reminder. It's a reminder of where we are as a nation that we have this blight. There have been 62 million lives taken since 1973. Think about that number for a second. 62 million. Wow. And it, it's not just 62 million people. It's 62 million of the most defenseless and innocent people and to make matters worse because I've talked to women who are past that procedure and in life and there are more than 62 losses of life there's been 62 million experiences followed by trauma and baggage and hurt full of regret and guilt a lot of these women have a hard time ever feeling forgiveness. And so it's not just a loss of life. We have a many, many women walking around looking to fix what's broken inside and find forgiveness. And so we need to pray this morning. We need to pray about the blight on our land that not only that the death uh, would cease, but also these women's lives could be healed. Uh, they need Christ. So, so let's just pray this morning before we jump in. Lord, we praise you today for uh, the winter wonderland outside, Lord. We praise you for the snow. And we praise you for this time to gather and be with you. But Lord, we also praise you for a nation of freedom and a, a place of, of uh, Lord, this democracy that we get to live in. But Lord, we, we know, we know life is sacred. We know that life is sacred to you. And Lord, we look at this this blight on our land, and we just ask that you would do a work, that you would move in our land, that we would, we would again honor life and respect it, and uh, you would help us also, Lord, not only to honor life, but to help uh, these countless number of women who have made this choice and regret it, that see abortion not as the solution it was promised to be, but actually as the problem for them right now. And Lord, we ask that you would help them find comfort and healing in Christ. That you would help them to find forgiveness and, and life after that, that experience, Lord. Just bless us, Lord. We need you. you. You're the only one that can fix and heal this. And we ask that you would. In Jesus' name, amen. So have you ever had that issue, that issue that you want to change, that that thing, maybe in your nation, in your family, the, this, this issue maybe where there's a lack of justice or something broken and you want to fix it. I mean, you're, you're motivated and maybe you dive in, you throw your full weight behind it and you want to be part of the solution. Have you ever had the experience of going all at it, volunteering and doing all of the tasks and yet finding at the end after all of the hard work that you didn't even really make a dent in the problem? The problem still exists, that, that <laughs> maybe a dent is even too generous. It may be you haven't even scratched the surface of the problem. I've had that experience. Uh, it's, it's incredibly uh, frustrating to work so hard to try to bring about a certain result and not see that result, to not see that you're making a difference. And that's exactly Moses' experience. Moses is driven by justice. He, he wants to fix things. He, he sees this incredible blight on his land, and he wants to bring it to an end. And, and he wants to put things right, but he's not able to. He's not able to make that down. He's not even able to scratch the surface, and that's his story. So let's pick it up today. We're in Exodus chapter 2, and I want to pick it up in verse 11, and this is what God's word says. It says, one day after Moses had grown up, <laughs> after he had grown up, what does that mean? 
Well, actually, if you go all the way to the book of Acts, you're going to find out that this story takes place when he's 40. So he's not a teenager, so he's not like 18 grown up in that way, and he's not even 21 in that way. He's past his teenage years. He's past his 20s. He's, he's way into his now 40 years of life. Hmm. He's finally to the point where he has experience. He has that education. He, he's, he's been around the block 40 years old. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. What's, what's going on here? The book of Hebrews has this hall of faith in it where we can go and see the greats of the faith and how they stood for faith and how faith changed their lives. And, and the greatest in that list, believe it or not, is a guy named Abraham, and he gets four attaboys. He gets four by faith, is the way Hebrews puts it. And he's got four, four times he really stood for faith. Well, Moses gets the next best result in a sense. He gets three attaboys. And one of them is right here. This is, this is what it says in Hebrews eleven twenty four 24 to 26. It says, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, and again at 40, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He said, that's it. He, he, he came to a place in life where he no longer wanted that privilege. He no longer, no longer wanted to be a part of the establishment and the elite. He, he was disgruntled and, and he was like, disgusted by what he saw. And he said, that's it. I don't longer want to be a part of this thing. So he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And so he chose instead to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. You, you just love the kind of experience initially where, where you have money and you have resources and you have cloud and you're part of the in-group and you're, you're part of, of, of everything that seems so special and everybody looks up to and want to be a part of it. But over time, you realize it's really not that special. And he, he, he is at the point where it's no longer what he wishes for. He, he wants to run from the pleasures of sin because it really doesn't have really long-term satisfaction for him. So he disowns it. And notice what it says. He regarded disgrace as a Jew, as a Hebrew. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as a greater value than the treasures of Egypt. Well, how did he know Christ? How is, what? Moses, that's thousands of years before Christ. What's, what's going on here? Christ was promised. Remember, Christ is not Jesus' last name. He's not Jesus Christ in that sense. Christ is a title, and it's a title for the Messiah, the anointed one, the promised one. And he was promised way before Moses. And so Moses was aware of this one who was to come and that the, this legacy, this incredible person who was to come was to come through his line and lineage through the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, his people. And, and he realized that all the treasures of Egypt were not worth it. They weren't worth having. What was worth having is being a part of that legacy of Christ, the one who would come and change all things. And that's what it says. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as a greater value than the treasures of Egypt. And trust me, he had the treasures of Egypt. But notice this, because he was looking ahead to his reward. He's thinking about heaven. He's thinking about what comes after life. And he knew that the, the track he was on was not going to lead to a good afterlife. He wanted heaven. He wanted God's favor. He wanted the blessing of eternal life. And so he turns his back. He turns his back on the ways of Egypt and that whole elitism and privilege. And he embraces his true heritage and all that goes with it, even persecution. So he's had this epiphany, this breakthrough. He's, he, in faith, he's turned from pleasure to now walking with God and the people of God. And so he's out. He's out and about now learning how his people live. So one day after Moses had grown up, he went out where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. And while he was out there looking at how his own people live, he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. So he, he saw an Egyptian, and the language is not a taskmaster, not someone in authority, but just an average Egyptian citizen beating up on a Hebrew one. 
And this disturbed him. And so it says in 12, looking this way and that and seeing no one. And we got to be careful how we read that because that could give us the impression that Moses was being surreptitious. He was like looking both ways to make sure nobody was looking so he could murder the guy. And that's actually not how it reads. It's more like, it's more like Moses looked left and right, hoping, hoping there was an authority figure, hoping there was a taskmaster, someone to intervene and say, hold it, you have no right here. You, you have no right to beat this man. You're out of place. He was looking for that kind of thing, but he didn't find anybody in authority. So looking this way and that and seeing no one to intervene, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So Moses comes from this mountaintop faith experience where he, he turns his back on the pleasures of Egypt and, and, and power and control. He turns his back on that, embraces his own people only to go out maybe even the, the very next day, and become a murderer. What's, what's going on here? What was going on in his head? What was, what is he thinking that this was the solution for the problem? That, that God would embrace this? That this was the right way to go? Well, believe it or not, <laughs> if you're looking to know his motives, the Bible does tell us what's going on in his head, what, where his heart's at, what, what's happening. And we can find that in Acts. Remember I told you he was 40 years old? Well, how do we know that? It's from this passage right here in Acts chapter 7. It says, when Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. And he saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian. So we went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. That's the story. But what was in his head? Well, Acts tells us Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them. What did he want? Moses wanted to lead a revolution. He wanted justice. He wanted to change the system and, and change his country. He saw this horrible blight on his land. He saw this, this issue of slavery and oppression. He says, this should not be. And he said, finally, he reached this point where I'm going to get involved and I'm going to fix this thing. <laughs> and maybe if I lead out, if, 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 if I start something that people would follow, maybe they'll see me as their rescuer. That's his hope, to start a revolution, to be a a part of the, the fix. But the sad thing is what comes next. But they did not. <laughs> he was hoping they would recognize him, that they would receive him, that he would be the guy for them, that he would be the redeemer and rescuer they were looking for. But they didn't. What's really interesting about these stories here is we've got to remember Moses is writing it. He gave us the book of Exodus. He's writing his own story. And what's absolutely amazing is for Moses, he says, of everything that I can tell you about my first 80 years of life. Now hear that number, 80 years of life. He condenses down to less than a chapter of information. He says, this is what you need to know about my life before I hit 80. And there's three little quick, kind of episodes there's this one here that we're looking at and there's another and they're all about justice they're all about him fixing things and he fails each time in a sense and he just continues to move downwardly rather than upwardly he's hoping they will recognize them as a rescuer but they don't the problem is is he's trying to do something that is opposed to the world that the world resists and fights against. He, he's trying to do a great work that goes against the flow and, and against the, the, the way other people swim. He's trying to go upstream with this thing. And the only way you make those kind of changes, the only way you, you have that kind of impact is with God. It's God's got to work in the hearts of people that they've got to realize it's wrong and they've got to turn and they you got to have a bigger, bigger, bigger solution than just let's just kill an Egyptian. And so God can't get behind Moses in this because Moses isn't with God in this. He's hoping God joins him rather than him joining God. 
And so he's getting out in front of God. And he has passion, he has zeal, and he's, he's like charging hell with a water pistol. But it's not going to do any good. He's just going to come away with singed eyebrows. Because God is like, hold it, I can't be a part of that. I can't be a part of murder. That's not how it works. In fact, Corinthians, if you go to 2 Corinthians, we're told this. He says, for though we live in the world, we have to be here in this world. We do not wage war as the world does. We can't, we can't fix things the way the world fixes things. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. They can't be. They have to be utterly different. And on the contrary, they have divine power, meaning they are what we need to demolish strongholds. But we got to use them. And Moses, in his ignorance and just his passion, he gets ahead of God and uses tools that God just cannot get behind. And God leaves him hanging. And Moses wants you to hear that. This is what you need to hear about my life <laughs> before. I tried to make a difference, and I failed. I got ahead of God, and I failed. And that's the first kind of quick story we get. And the next one comes right on the hills, verse 13, the next day. So the very next day, he goes out again, right, to be amongst his people, to be a part of this now revolution he's hoping to start. He's still thinking it's going to happen. And so the next day, he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, the bully in the mix, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? He's like, hold it, dude, if we're ever going to solve this problem, if we're ever going to fix this problem, we're going to have to stick together. We can't, we can't fight amongst ourselves. A house divided against itself will fall. We've got to be united against our enemy. You can't be abusing your own fellow Hebrew. <laughs> and the bully in the mix said, who made you ruler and judge over us? <laughs> and that's a good question. And it should be one that haunts Moses. Who put you in charge? Who, who gave you permission? Who, who called you to this task? Nobody. He's called himself. Who made you ruler and judge? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? And that was devastating because that meant the word was out. And then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. Word is out. He thought he did it with nobody watching, but sure enough, he was caught. And this is a problem for Pharaoh. He, he remember, his, his passion is to keep the people. He, do, he doesn't want a revolution. He wants security. And he sees now Moses as a liability. He's got to do something about it. And so that's verse 15. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. He put a hit out on Moses. Even though he's raised in his house and raised by his daughter, <laughs> He could not allow this to stand. And I believe God intervened. I believe God rescued him somehow. The, they obviously didn't succeed. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian where he sat down by a well. That's a second failure. He tried to intervene with brothers and it didn't work. Hebrew, two Hebrew men. So he has to flee. And he flees to Midian. So Midian is, is, is a group of people, and, and they have this region in which they do their thing, and they're shepherds. They're wandering shepherds, living in tents, taking care of their sheep. And believe it or not, they're descendants of Abraham as well. Abraham had his wife, Sarah, but after Sarah died, Abraham took another wife named Keturah, and the Midianites come from her line. And so these Midianites are out in the wilderness, out doing their sheep thing, and he finds his way as Midian, and he finds himself as a well. And believe it or not, if you go all the way to Hebrews again, this is where you find the second attaboy, the second by faith, because this is what it says. It says, by faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. And hold it. <laughs> you may be saying that right now. Hold it, Mike. You just said that he was afraid of Pharaoh. He was. But in the end, that's not why he left. He was initially afraid, but in the end, he worked through that and on the other side, left in faith. How? What kind of faith? By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger anymore. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. What does that mean? Meaning he saw God's hand in this, that God was still working in his life. And this is, this is the thing. We can make terrible mistakes in life. 
Moses made a huge one, right? He's now a murderer. <laughs> you go to the post office and he's on the FBI most wanted list, right? He, he, he's a criminal, the most wanted in the land. And God still wants to use him. God still wants to be involved in his life. And that's the incredible thing about our mistakes. In Christ, we can find forgiveness. We, we can move beyond them. And so by faith, he left Egypt thinking, okay, God, I know you're in this somehow. I, I don't know how, but I'm leaving. And your will for me must be out there somewhere. And I'm going to go find it. I'm going to go, I'm going to go find your plan for my life. And that's what he does. He, he searches for God's invisible hand. So he finds himself in Midian, he finds himself by this well, and in verse 16, now a priest of Midian had seven daughters. No sons, seven daughters. So he's a nomad, he's in a tent, he's got seven daughters, all of these sheep, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water the father's flock. So at the end of the day, they come to the, the community well and they, they want to water their sheep. Some shepherds came, some other shepherds, and these are not the good kind, these are the bully kind, came along and drove them away. So they drive the seven women away. They, they're, they're like bullies on the school playground saying, get out of here, and taking their lunch money, and just, we were here first, and they're, they're just abusive and, and gruff with them, and drive them off so they can water their sheep before them. But Moses, again, justice, he has a problem with this. He sees this, and he intervenes, but Moses got up. And came to their rescue and watered their flock. The good news is it looked like he really did make a difference this time. And even better news, he didn't kill anybody in the process. Well, this is not the end of the story in, in Midian. When the girls returned to Ruel, another name for Ruel is Jethro. It's the same guy, just two different names for the same guy. When they came to Ruel, the father, who is the priest of Midian... This is not a priest like in Jehovah or Yahweh. He, he's, he's not with the one true God. He's, he's not of the faith. He will later become of the faith, but he's not yet. But they come home to their father and they asked him, oh, sorry, he asked them, why have you returned so early today? What that tells me is that the bullies on the playground do this every day that the shepherds come and drive them away and they're always the last one to water their sheep. And so they get home later than everybody else. And today, because Moses helped, they show up early and the father's like, hold it, what happened with the bullies? Well, what's going on? Why have you returned so early today? They answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. Well, this this was great news to Jethro, to Ruel. He's like, where is he? Because there's way too much estrogen in his tent right now. Right? There's no man around. His girls do all the work with the shepherds. And, and he needs to find a man to hang with. And he needs men to marry his daughters. And so he's like, what? There was this guy and he had honor. And, and, and he seemed like a good guy. Where is he? Ruel asked his daughters, why did you leave him? What were you thinking? An eligible guy like that, invite him to have something to eat. So they invite Moses over to the house and this relationship starts to build and Jethro likes him and he likes Jethro and Moses has nothing going for him anyway. He's still searching for God's invisible hand. And so Moses eventually, after who knows how long, agreed to stay with the man and be kind of like the, another man in the house. And then over time, even longer eventually Jethro gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage and Zipporah means ladybird he gave ladybird to Moses verse 22 Zipporah gave him gave birth to a son eventually and Moses named him Gershom saying I have become a foreigner in a foreign land and that's heavy this is not a exciting thing he's Moses is feeling really out of place he's in the wilderness He's in the wilderness of Midian, and he's realizing how far he's fallen. He, he went from this pinnacle in Egypt. He went from this high place of, of elitism and privilege. He's part of the establishment. And, and ever since then, he's been coming down. Ever since he's been having these faith moments, he's spiraling down. He tries to intervene and be the redeemer, and the people reject him. He tries to break up a fight even amongst Hebrews, and they're like, who are you? Get out of our face. You're going to just kill one of us too. And then, then he has to run and he's got to flee. And even there, when he gets to this foreign land, he ends up being a shepherd, a foreigner 
in a foreign land. One of the most despised things in Egyptian culture is a shepherd. It was considered the most demeaning and despised job in Egyptian culture. And here he is, trained for these incredible tasks and duties to, in administration. And he's out doing the most menial, look down upon job there is. He's shepherding sheep. And I'm sure he had many days in the wilderness because there's 40 years of them. Think about that. 40 years in Egypt, now 40 years amongst the Midianites. And it's not till 80 that God calls him into the ministry. 80 years. He had 40 long years as a shepherd. And I'm sure there were many days he felt overqualified. That it wasn't being used to his potential. That, that God was overlooking him and, 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 and wasn't taking advantage of him. That God wasn't even a good steward of the resources that had been put in him. And he, he, I'm sure he had days where he was frustrated and, and angry and, and, and feeling overlooked. Like he couldn't make a difference that he wanted to make. He had all those people back in Egypt and slavery and he couldn't do anything about it. He felt handicapped and isolated and he's just a foreigner in a foreign land. And so I'm sure there were days <laughs> over time, because God's doing a work in his life in these 40 years, over time where he eventually, eventually accepted his place. Maybe, maybe he even said, well, I, I kind of deserved it. I, 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 I did kill a man. And maybe eventually he got to the place like, this is just jail. This is what God's doing. I'm, I'm, I'm serving my time. But God was doing something big in Moses. Something we should pay attention to. Because before Moses wasn't ready. But God was making him ready. God was doing a work. One of the things that Moses is most famous for. One of the things that the Bible tells us. Is that Moses was a humble man. And there's nothing like 40 years in the wilderness taking care of sheep when you're educated to do so much more. That, that'll humble you. 40 years. I, I love the next verse because notice this. During that long period, it's like God saying, you have to realize this was long for Moses. But it was formative. It was, it was shaping him. God was developing character in Moses. He had to get them to the place where he would do what God wanted him to do and not what he wanted to do. That he would do things God's way in God's time. And Moses hadn't been ready before. But the, at the end of 80 years, he'd finally be ready. It was this work that God had to do in him. But more than that, notice what it says. During that long period of time, the king of Egypt died. So this change of the guard, so to speak, in, in Egypt... But more than that, the Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and this, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. Remember, the Jews as, as a whole had abandoned their faith in God, the one true God, the God of their fathers. It, it looked like from their perspective, he had failed and abandoned them. And so they saw them blessing Egypt and doing so well by them that they said, well, let's worship the Egyptian gods. And they did for a while and they totally embraced them and gave themselves fully to that, abandoning the real faith. But guess what happened over time? The Egyptian gods failed them too. They didn't rescue them. And so over time, they realized that was a mistake. And in this 40-year period, God's doing a work, not only changing the leadership structure of Egypt, but he's working in the hearts of his people and turning them towards home again, getting them ready. And because of it, everything changes. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And it's not like God really forgot. That's, that's not what it's trying to say. It's just that as God's people turned their hearts back towards God, God turned his heart back towards them and realized they were ready. And he said, okay, now it's time for the covenant. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. This is the thing about God. God hates injustice. God hates what's going on with the Jews. 
But his timing, this timing thing is huge. God wants to do this in the fullness of time. He, he wants everything to be ready and perfect for this incredible thing he's about to do in that land of Egypt. And it's going to be absolutely incredible. But he's getting all the players ready. And the huge part of that is getting Moses ready to really be the change agent he needs to be. I think one of the reasons I found I was so unsuccessful in some of the things I tried to change was because I wasn't ready yet to be used by God in that kind of way yet. I wasn't, I wasn't humble. I wasn't submissive to his will. I was, I was charging hell with the water pistol, and I was doing things my way and, and expecting God to honor it and follow my lead rather than me following his lead. And I think a lot of us struggle with that. We, 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 get, we get all excited and we want to charge out and, and do these things. But God's not with us and we fail. We're not ready to be used yet by him. Think about all the things in life maybe that you want. The things that you want to change. Maybe, maybe you want to see your kids come to Christ. Maybe you want to see them walk with God. Become independent, you know solid believers maybe maybe you want to see your husband come to christ maybe you want to see the end of human trafficking or end world hunger right there's there's all of these things we could be a part of all of these massive things well how do you actually change them how do you actually bring it about you can go about doing it your own way but the bible says that won't work in fact the bible is very clear for instance, in John 15, 5, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples, which includes us, right? He says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. And if you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And that's what we want. We want to bear fruit. Well, how do you do that? By pressing into me, so I can press into you. There's got to be this, this codependent kind of complementary thing where we totally lean into him for everything we want to accomplish, because he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And that's what Moses found out. Apart from him, he could do nothing. The Old Testament way of putting this is this. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. It's not by your might. It's not by your power. It's by my spirit. It's by me. It's by my power. And if you really want to change the world, you've got to do it my way. If you really want an impact in your kid's life, this is how you do it. If you really want to impact your husband for Christ, this is how you do it. And if you really want to impact world hunger, if you really want to impact this, whatever it might be, there's a strategy. This has so troubled me because I so want to make an impact. Of all the things, we can make all these lists of things that we want to change. But the thing that I'm most passionate about, the thing that drives me more than them all, believe it or not, is a thing called revival. I want to see revival in our land. I want, to, I want our nation to have this incredible awakening. God's done it a couple times in our history, and it's been phenomenal. And I want to see him do it again in my time, in my day. I want to see God work in a huge way. And I've got excited about it and thrown myself behind that, trying to bring it about on my own. And guess what? Crash and burn, right? Because that's not how God works. But in the process, God showed me something and helped me learn that there is a recipe and it's a recipe not just for revival. It's a recipe for any change we want to make. Notice the wording. So, so go, to, go to 2, Corinthians, uh, sorry, sorry, 2 Chronicles 7.14. Because I believe this is a recipe for change. How we, his people, change the world. Or work with God to change the world. Notice what he says. He says, if my people, that's us, that's me, that's Moses, right? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. Notice the first ingredient. It is humility. And that's what Moses was known for. And if you look around the Bible, if you look at other places, like, for instance, wives reaching their husbands, this is a big piece of that one, according to Peter. It's a part of the recipe, is us getting to the end of ourselves and realizing, I can't do this myself. I can't move in people's hearts. I can't change the flow of a nation and a culture. This is way bigger than me. I, there's no way I can affect change in this. I need you. And so I, I, I'm not getting ahead of you. <laughs> I'm not bossing you around. <laughs> I, 
I'm, I'm the servant here, and I, I'm the one you send to do things your way. It's getting to the end of yourself. That's where Moses had to get, the end of himself. And if you will humble themselves, and what? And pray. They flow one from the other. We, when we actually get humble, what happens? We realize we can do it, and we start begging God to do it. We start banging on the doors of heaven and saying, God, please revive us. God, please save my children. God, please save my husband. God, please give me a soulmate. And we bang, we humbled first, then we bang, we pray, and seek my face is the third one. What's that? That's his direction. It's it's a symbol of the sovereign king on his throne and seeking his face, seeking his favor, seeking his direction, his lead, his timing. It's basically, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. It's looking to him for everything. We've got to humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and notice this and turn from our wicked ways. The pride in us says, well, that's not me. I don't have any wicked ways. I've turned from my wicked ways. The way the Bible uses wicked, it's not that. It's any sin in our lives. And we still have problems, right? We're still growing. We're not perfect yet. We're not like Christ. And what this is about is, is, is working on us before we try to work on the world. It's like, it's like hey, if, if you really want to reach your children for Christ... Maybe you, start, you should start looking like Christ in your home. Turn from your wicked ways. Show them what it looks like. Help them to see something in you that they actually want in their own life. This is what Moses had to do. He had to turn from murder and, 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 and aggression. Turn from violence. We all have this thing that we could work on in our life. We need to become a person that can be used by God to make a difference in the world. And that means becoming like Jesus. And we all need to give up our pride. We all need to give up more selfishness. We all need to give up that sense of need for control and that lust and greed and the whole package. We've got to turn from our wicked ways. But notice if we'll do it. If we'll put all these things together, notice the promise. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins. And notice how he puts it and will heal their land, heal your land, heal your marriage, heal that brokenness in your husband, or heal that rift between you and your kids. It's, it's not just about revival. It's not just about awakening. It's, it's about abortion. It's about world hunger. They're all rifts. They're all blights on your land. And if you really want to affect change, God's saying this is how you do it. You humble yourself and you pray. You beg God to do the work that you can't do. And you seek his face for his direction and how to do it. And then you work on yourself, becoming more and more like Christ. So he can work through you. The big idea is if God is not using you yet and you're frustrated by that, God, why why don't you use me? You're like Moses. You're in the wilderness. If God is not using you yet, it might be because you are not ready to be used yet. You're not to a place where he says, you're right for this yet. And so, if your passion is to find your soulmate, well, humble yourself and pray and seek your face and work on you. Work on becoming that that man of God who can be the spiritual leader in the home. So when you find that woman... Or, or likewise, ladies, if you're looking for your soulmate, pray for that guy. But work on yourself so you can honor them in that future relationship. But the point is, is we shouldn't stay stagnant. God's in process in all of our lives, and we should let him do that work, and we should join him in that work. And it took Moses 80 years to get to the point where God says, okay, you're ready. Let's go to Egypt. So if we're not ready yet, if that's where you are, if that's just the reality of the situation, then go get ready. Get ready to change the world. Get ready to make a difference. Humble yourself. Pray. Seek his face. Turn from 
any, any sin in your life, that he might use you and heal our land. Because right now in America, we need some healing. There's a lot of things that are broken. But this is how they're fixed. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you this morning for being a great God of love who wants to make a difference. You're just looking for a people that you can make a difference through. And Lord, we just ask that, 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 that you would help us as we kind of live in the wilderness right now. That you, you would help us to see that, that, that you will use us, that you want to use us. You're, you're, you're making us ready and help us to join you in the process of that. Help us to become more and more a humble people, more and more a people of prayer, and more and more of people that honors you and your word and your ways and your direction. And Lord, help us to be a people that are becoming more like Christ, that more and more are transformed, that, that we are becoming you. And help the world to see that and help that to have merit and clout in the world's eyes that they could see this humility, they can see this love, they can see this grace and mercy and kindness and goodness. They can see all of this in you so that we get a hearing so that we can be a part of something bigger than ourselves, so that you can work through us. You can change the world just as you did through Moses. Make us useful. Lord, we yearn. We beg you. Make us useful. And use us. Make us ready. And let us begin to see healing in our land, in our homes, in our communities, all across our land. There's so much broken. There's so much that needs doing. Let us, Lord, give us the privilege of being a part and watching you work through us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, God, thank you. That's always our response. Thank you. Grander earth is quaked before, moved by the sound of his voice. And seas that are shaken and stirred Can be calmed and broken for my regard And through it all, through it all My eyes are on you Through it all, through it all it is well Through it all my eyes are on you, and it is well with me. It is well with me.
will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire and darkest night. You are close like no other. the goodness
faithful, loving, <laughs> there when we need you, God. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. You know, you know the plan you have for us, God, and you make us ready. <laughs> In Jesus' name, amen. Church family, thank you all so much for joining us online this morning. Hope you are staying safe. Hope you are staying warm. Uh, if you are new, if you're joining us uh, for the first time, or if you've only been around for a little bit, thank you all for joining us as well. Uh, we'd love to get to know you. If you could go to our website, icecreamdurham.com, there's resources there. There's ways for you to get connected. Uh, we just love to tell you more about who we are, ways that you can get involved. If you're part of the Life Stream family, uh, there's ways to give online. You can give even though we're not meeting here in person. Uh, we look forward to just coming back next week. Hopefully the, the snow will be gone, the ice will be gone, and we'll be able to gather again in person next Sunday. Thanks again for joining us. Let's pray one last time. God, we do love you. We thank you for this morning, for this time of worship, that even if we aren't gathered together in one place, in one building, we're still able to gather in spirit uh, and lift our voices to you uh, and exalt your name and learn from your word and celebrate who you are and the good things that you have done for us. And we love you, God, and we just thank you for, for the many ways that we can celebrate you and worship you. Thanks, y'all. Have a good week.